frequently ask questions, um, but we do reserve the right to remove anyone using offensive language from the event. Um, tonight, we're super excited and grateful to our great partners and co-sponsors that made this possible. Uh, listed here on this slide, they include ANJEC, the New Jersey uh, Environmental Com uh, Commissions, uh, also the Clinicians for Climate Action here in New Jersey, the Nature Conservancy, Water Spirit, New Jersey Sustainable Business Council, and the New Jersey Conservation Foundation. At New Jersey LCV, we know environmental policies are only as strong as the environmental champions in office who support those policies. And so throughout the year, we host these legislative meet and greets for constituents to get to know their legislators and see where they stand on issues like climate change, local flooding, clean energy, transportation, and offshore wind. We know one of the biggest challenges in environmental issues is facing our, uh, our climate challenge head on um, for our children, and our future generations. And we, we're not gonna be able to do this alone. Um, and it's critical because we've seen deadly storms and wildfires increase on our coastal and inland areas. We also know that um, you know these storms, they're said to be once in a lifetime, but in fact, in, uh, the, in a 30 year mortgage, um, you can actually experience a 100 year storm. And with it, we're seeing chronic flooding that pollutes our waterways and damages our property. And we've faced record heat waves, uh, excuse me for that. And um, you know, many of us have headed to the New Jersey shore so we could cool off. Um, but today we have two distinguished guests who represent the New Jersey shore. We have Assemblywoman Dr. Marjorie Donlin and Assemblywoman Luann Peter Paul, who represent Eastern Monmouth County in the 11th Legislative District alongside Senator Vingo Paul. And I'll do some brief introductions to our freshman legislators, and then we're going to hear from both of them about their experience so far, their environmental priorities, and of course, we'll have the opportunity for all of you to get to know your elected officials to ask some questions. So again, if you have a question, feel free to drop it into the Q&A. Uh, Assemblywoman Dr. Marjorie Donlin was elected to the New Jersey State Assembly in 2023 as the first female physician in the legislature, and she is dedicated to improving health care policy. She's a board-certified practicing physician specializing in caring for patients with injuries and disabilities. Previously, Dr. Donlin served as the deputy mayor of Ocean Township, where she sat on town council from 2019 to 2023. In Ocean, she acted as the liaison to the Environmental Commission, the Shade Tree Commission, and the Green Team. And she's worked in alliance with the Deal Lake Commission and the Deal Lake Watershed Alliance on important local issues and environmental issues. Dr. Donlin also served as a member of the Legislative District 11 Economic Advisory Council in 2020 during the coronavirus pandemic and was selected for Governor Murphy's Healthcare Transition Advisory Committee in 2017. In addition to serving on the board of the Surfers Medical Association, she's an avid surfer and an active volunteer with the Surfers Environmental Alliance and the Best Day Foundation, teaching adaptive surfing to kids with disabilities. Dr. Donlin resides in Ocean Township with her husband, Ron, and her two daughters, Amalia and Vera. Assemblywoman Luann Peterpaul was born in Newark and a resident of Monmouth County for many years. Luann Peterpaul is a lawyer and was elected in uh, to the New Jersey Assembly in 2023 as well, and is a managing partner of Peter Paul Law in Asbury Park. Uh, Assemblywoman Peter Paul previously served as the assistant Essex prosecutor, where she successfully prosecuted cases against criminals ranging from theft to homicide before being appointed as the municipal judge for the cities of Long Branch and Asbury Park, where she served from 2018 to 2022. She fundamentally believes in equal rights for all individuals and has dedicated her life's work in advancing protections for marginalized individuals so people of all walks of life are able to call New Jersey their home. As the former chair of the Garden State Equality Action Fund, Peter Paul, the first out gay woman to assume the position in state assembly, played a critical role in creating and promoting anti-bullying legislation in the state legislature and was instrumental in bringing marriage equality to New Jersey through her role on the board of directors of Garden State Equality. Assemblywoman Peter Paul is committed to supporting families and children with illness, serving on the advisory committee of the Untenberg Children's Hospital of Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Hospital in Monmouth Medical Center, and on the board of the Thomas Peter Paul Foundation. She currently resides in Long Branch with her wife, Robin. 
Um, so you've heard a lot from me so far, but we've got a lot more excitement um, to hear from our elected officials. And I want to thank you both for being here, but also thank uh, the constituents that are here as well. So I'm going to open it up um, to talk a little bit about themselves, their environmental platform and experiences before we begin a sort of moderated discussion. So I'm going to turn it over to Assemblywoman Dr. Donlin for some opening remarks. And thank you again for being here. You're very welcome. Thank you for having us. It's a real pleasure um, to be here. Um, as a physician live, who lived through the um, COVID pandemic, I have to say Zoom is probably the best thing that came out of that time period. So it's really great to be able to connect with so many people um, across the state. Um, I am the assemblywoman for LD11 along with Luann Peter Paul. Um, we were elected last November and we've been serving since January. Um, I came to this area, uh, the Jersey Shore, when I was a resident. I was doing my residency up in um, in Newark as a physiatrist, um, and I would come down every morning, especially in the summer. I'd put my surfboard on on my car and leave at four o'clock in the morning before when it was pitch black. Come down here, and um, and just absolutely fell in love with the Jersey Shore, um, being cl close to the ocean. It's just such a magical place. It's a healing place. Um, so I, I fell in love with it and, and moved here. Um, and now I live here, as you mentioned, with my husband, Ron, and my two daughters, Amalia and Vera. Vera is three. Amalia is 14. And I think having kids, um, you know, who, you know, you think about what, what, what kind of world they're inheriting from us. That was my main impetus to go into politics, because we want to protect the world that we have and we want to give it to our our children and the next generation um, in a better state than we found it. Um, so that's really what drove me to, to go into politics um, initially. Um, I love um, this area, but I love all parts of New Jersey and um, I'm a big avid skier. I love being in the in in the in the uh, in the mountains in the winter and climate change. You know, that's a scary prospect for our world and, you know, trying to think, will we even be skiing 10 to 20 years from now with climate change um, and increase in temperatures? Um, as a deputy mayor here in Ocean Township, um, there was huge issues about flooding, um, constant concern about what we could do. Um, tree protection was a big issue as well, um, making sure that people knew the importance of uh, protecting trees. How could we encourage people to, um, to, to um, maintain trees and not cut them down? Um, unnecessarily. So those are some of the local issues that that we worked on. Um, you, you talked a lot about my background, so I'm not sure what else I can add. Um, as an avid, avid surfer, um, I also, like you mentioned, take out kids uh, with a lot with disabilities out surfing. Um, in fact, this morning I was in Asbury Park Beach um, taking a group of, of kids who have autism out to experience the ocean. So I mean, my my approach to climate change, and it's just that we we need to protect our environment. We need to look at ways um, to reduce our fuel emission emissions and um, reduce flooding. So that's those are my priorities in the legislature, and I'm really happy to be here and having this discussion. Awesome, and and thank you for that. Um, uh, you know, I think it's interesting too with your medical background and the health implications that are you know a co-benefit of reducing the pollution that's causing climate change is also making the air healthier to breathe, breathe to reduce asthma, cancer, heart disease, and, and the, you know, negative health implications of burning oil and gas um, as we transition to cleaner energy sources, which is, I think, just critical for our, our future, but also the health of our, our communities and the, the families that live within them. So I, I appreciate that. So uh, I'll pass it over to Assemblywoman Peter Paul for a little opening remarks, and then we'll get into some questions. If you have questions, please drop them into the Q&A, and we'll get to those um, in just a few minutes. So I, I do want to thank you and, and uh, LCV for having us here and uh, the individuals who are going to be posing questions to us. It's our opportunity uh, to get to meet you and you to get to meet us and understand what our passions are. And I say us and our, because this is a team. I mean, as you could hear from uh, Dr. Donlin, her background is tremendous in, in the environmental arena. Her passion uh, for looking at how to better New Jersey is can't be beat. So it, it, it is such a team. And we couple that up with um, Senator Gopal. 
Uh, you gave most of my background. But let me add a, a little bit, little bit more to it. Okay, so I, I, I did. I was born in Essex County, but every summer we summered down here at the Jersey Shore. Um, my, my mom's family had a home in Long Branch. I actually learned how to walk on the Long Branch boardwalk. So I've grown to appreciate the value of what we have here in Monmouth County. And I also serve um, on the Commerce, Economic Development and Agriculture Committee. And I've now grown to, to learn a lot more about the agricultural industry in our state, which is tremendous and also impacted by climate change, uh, by the environmental issues that are going on. In fact, one, one of the areas, and we'll get into a lot more, but one of the areas that we're looking into is you know native plants and preserving native plants um, and non-invasive uh, non-native plants coming into our state and what the damage that is causing that also has an impact not only on um, the agricultural industry but also on small business as as a whole but you know my background is really about raising voices it's really about allowing individuals to be heard, whether that is someone who is marginalized. Um, you know, I come from the LGBTQ plus community, but also about hearing the voices that are concerned about our environment. I mean, more and more we hear about the fires, the wildfires that are occurring, um, not only in California, but here in New Jersey, it's devastating. Uh, what's going on with the erosion of our beaches, the flooding, um, the surprise flooding that's going on in our area. And our team has worked very hard to try and deal with a lot of those issues um, by assisting in terms of studies that need to be done. How do, how do we protect the watershed? How, how do we um, better the areas? But one of the things that I, I do want to raise and, and what I am also proud of, uh, I've been with my wife for 41 years. Um, We've been married for 14, oh, I said 14, it's not 14, it's 10. I wish it was 14. Um, 10 years when we were able to achieve marriage equality in the state of New Jersey. And, and why do I raise that issue? Families are important. All different types of families are important. And the environment impacts all of us, um, whether it's a family of two or a family of four or a family of one. Um, the environment impacts everything we do every single day. So I just want to emphasize the fact that this team, um, the LD11 team, um, is really interested in seeing what we can do to assist um, in, in correcting the errors that have occurred in the past. Awesome. And it, there's no doubt there's a lot of work to be done. And the interesting thing about climate change and how it affects the shore is but today there was a hearing, joint assembly and Senate hearing about beach erosion. And from the storms and the intensity, the sheer volume of work that needs to happen um, along the beaches. Um, you know, there are things we can do to prevent that by reducing our fossil fuel usage. Um, but you know, this was what we had a record heat day just a few days ago. This year is likely going to be the hottest year on record. And the year before that was the hottest year on record. And the year before that was the hottest year on record. And the year before that was the hottest year on record. Um, and, and with it, these these massive um influxes, like like I mentioned, you know, the hundred year storm is a 30 year event, and that number is shrinking. And um, you know, with it, there's a high cost to families. We see in the in the shore community sort of um like sunny day flooding. These are areas that hadn't traditionally flooded before. And that means it's not a rain event, it's tidal and with rising sea levels. Um, and I'm supposed to go to a, a question a little bit more about like sort of process, but one of the um, you know folks, Kathleen had written here, you know, is there anything being done in the county to sort of monitor that? Is there any tracking around roadways that, you know, are frequently flooded? I mean, I know if you live in a community, you know, to bring rubber boots with you, to avoid certain route, uh, you know, routes on high tide because the roads can become impassable. Um, is that something that, that you all are working on or that you know of uh, as a tracking um, the roadways that maybe need to be elevated or could become a hazardous? Well, one of the things that um, we, we recently supported a um, budget resolution allocating $500,000 to three towns 
who are dealing with flooding issues, Neptune, Neptune City, Bradley Beach, because yeah. to get, um, you know, you, you might have separate towns, you know, all dealing with their own issues, but we live in watersheds, right? So, and that often crosses town boundaries. So um, it's really important for towns to work together to do the work to study where the issues are in their particular watershed. Um, so that's one initiative that we supported and received funding for um, allocated a budget resolution that passed this year. Um, but for towns that um, are, are having flooding issues, I encourage everybody to get together with neighboring towns and um, put together those requests for, um, for, for more research to find out where we can um, make a difference and have an impact in, in your particular watershed area. And, and to add to what um, Margie has just said, it is important we're using um, <clears throat> this as kind of a pilot program, right? Yeah. To show what towns can do when you work together. And we're hoping what will happen is that towns will see the success of putting this together and then join um, on board because it, it's best to work together rather than, than to do it separately. That's great. And um, okay, so back to running for office. Um, so it's not an easy decision to run for office at any level. So a lot of courage is required. And, you know, my appreciation in our organization to anyone who puts their hat in the ring. Um, can you talk each of you a little bit about, you know, your decision to run and your background in the district and, and sort of what drove you to make that decision? Um, and, you know, any kind of insights for folks that might be considering that at the local level or at the state level, I mean, there's more scrutiny. It seems at each at each turn. So maybe I'll I'll go to you, Assemblywoman Peter Paul, to to go first on that one. Sure. So you know, as you know, my background was in advocacy, um, lawyer by day, advocate also by day, um, <laughs> and once I became a municipal court judge, my voice was kind of silent. Right. So I wasn't able to speak. Uh, to the truth of what was going on in the world, whether it was politics or or advocating for particular groups. And there came a point in time, especially after the Dobbs decision was decided, overturning Roe versus Wade, where I, I knew I had to, to seek my voice once again. And then um, I was introduced to Margie Donnelly. And um, both of us had the same vision. If you run, I'll run. Um, and we made a dare, and that's what happened. Um, I I knew Margie's background. I I read a lot about her, and I knew that once if we put together a team of two strong women with um, Senator Gopal in the lead, um, because obviously we needed his support um, with Senator Gopal in the lead, it it would make a big difference. And and I do think we are making a difference. Thank you for that. Yeah, no, it's really, I'm I'm really um, glad that I ran for assembly. It was not an easy decision for me. I was um, in Ocean Township feeling like I was working on a lot of great projects and it takes time to get things done in municipal government. And so I didn't want to just leave, you know, not finishing certain projects. I mean, one was revising our tree ordinance. Another was um, getting some dredging projects off the ground in Deal Lake. Uh, those are things that I was passionate about and I wanted to see to completion. So uh, to pull me away from that and 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 run for state office, it was it was a big ask um, and it was a big task. I had a lot of great support. People encouraged me, encouraging me to do it. And it, I'm so glad that I did. I, I'm really um, glad that I'm I had the experience at the local level because I can advocate um, for for local towns and, and knowing what their needs are um, at the state level. Um, when I initially decided to run, I actually ran for county commissioner back in 2017, not having any background at all in politics and not really wanting to get involved in politics at all. But I think after the 2016 election and having a daughter, a young daughter, she was six at the time, you know, and 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 the threats about the defunding of the EPA. I mean, it was just so, you know, I, I was I was really worried for the world that my daughter who was going to grow up in. And she saw me very upset about that election and and said, Mom, I think you should run for president. And that was uh, kind of what inspired me. You know, I, I've got to do something. I've got to step up at the local level. So I, I ran for for what was then Freeholder 
uh, now county commissioner in, in Monmouth County. I lost that race. Um, but you know what? There's a lot of lessons that you learn in losing a race. Um, and it. Um, I just want to encourage anyone who's thinking about running to just do it. Or if you want to just get involved at the local level, you know, find out if there's openings on your um, on your environmental board, on your on your uh, green team, shade tree commission in your towns, because we I think everybody needs um, advocacy at the local level. So if you're thinking about running, do it. But if you want to, you know, join something and do something locally, those are some really great places to start as well um, and is so needed. So I encourage anyone thinking about running to just do it. Well, I'm going to sort of dig in a little bit more, too, because life in the legislature as women uh, is probably different than the predominant male representation that exists. And so I wanted to see if you could share a little bit about what that experience has been like. And, you know, Assemblywoman Peter Paul, with your background as what I think you're number two out of 120 in the legislature that's openly LGBTQ plus. Um, I, I think I have that right. Um, it's not statistically appropriate. That's not the right representation. Um, so you're in underrepresented, com you know, individuals from underrepresented communities in the legislature. Um, you know, it's just not representative of New Jersey's demographics. So what's that been like so far um, uh, to both as, you know, being in the space as an honor, but also has there been any challenges around that um, or any insights that you can provide um, you know, as uh, optimistically, but realistically too, for folks, so they understand what we you know, what's that like to be one of the few people in the room representing a community or a gender, you know, I don't know who wants to take it first, so. I'll, I'll take it first and okay, then great. Margie. So, and, and we're also un, un, underrepresented gender wise, right? We lost, we lost some, um, some, women in our legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, what has it been oh, like? I meant to say that if I wasn't clear, women are underrepresented yeah. significantly as yes. well. Yes. Um, so someone asked me, what is the most surprising thing about being in the legislature? And, you know, I went in thinking with all the vitriol that's going out on in the world today, that it was really going to be, we were going to be at each other's throat. And what I found is quite the opposite. Um, the majority of individuals, both Republicans and Democrats, no matter what gender, race, um, ethnicity, uh, you know, LGBTQ or, or not, um, want to have a dialogue, right? They, I, I think that the majority of us want to get something done. There have been hiccups. I, I can't say that there haven't been. Um, there have been hiccups along the way, especially when it comes to issues that impact uh, my community, the LGBTQ plus community. But what I found was that when there are those hiccups, you turn around and, and there's a bunch of people behind you. Um, there's a bunch of people that have your back. And it's just been heartwarming and sometimes a little bit heartbreaking when you hear some of the vitriol. But for the most part, it's been heartwarming forming. One of the lessons that I learned in my advocacy and I'd like to see more of going on in our legislature is individuals coming in and telling their life experiences. I think that makes a tremendous impact on getting a point across or making, you know, what the issue is that you're presenting, making someone understand what it is and the importance of it rather than submitting written documentation. I think written documentation is important, don't get me wrong, but when you hear that life experience, when you hear the emotion and you hear the passion, it just makes a huge difference. And um, I'm beginning to see that again. As far as the LGBTQ plus community issue, issues are concerned, I think we need a lot more education. I'm, I'm somewhat disappointed um, in the reception that uh, some of the issues um, have received that have been presented to the legislature. And I think we need to educate a lot more. And that goes along with any of the other issues, environmental issues. People need to understand what it is that you're trying to, to say and, and to make a difference. And legislatures are humans, we're humans. We need to understand that also and feel what your passion is. No, thank you for that. 
but it's good to hear people are working together in a way that's different than what you see on TV. And that's my feeling as well in the legislature. I don't know, after 13 years, I find it surprising. I actually find it encouraging, but most folks don't see politics that way. So I think it's really nice to, to hear you express that. Uh, Assembly woman, Dr. Donlin, I would want to hear a little bit, yeah. Agree with um, my um, Assemblywoman uh, Peter Paul on all of that. It's, it's. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I didn't want to get involved in politics is the perception that it's so, you know, hateful and antagonistic and everything. And I think for the most part, people want to solve issues and they want to work together. And we've sponsored um, bipartisan, um, bipartisan uh, legislation. I think women in general, I have to say, might or probably do a better job at that. Um, which is, you know, working with other people, listening, collaborating. They generally have these qualities that um, that um, that work towards, you know, putting issues at the center and problem solving and that sort of thing. Um, so I think that's one reason why um, having women in the legislature is important. Um, not to say that there aren't plenty of men who do that too, and Senator Gopal is is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's been a, a great force for, for getting women elected and getting women into politics. So he's he's also a, a great force for that. I think um, I, I'm actually the first woman physician in ever in the state legislature. Um, when I was elected, there was at the time there's only one man physician in who's uh, currently running for Congress. Um, when I was elected, also there was another male physician who. Um, is happens to be a Republican, but I remember one time when we were being introduced um, in our first committee meeting, and he was introduced as doctor, and I was introduced as Miss Assemblywoman, and it was just it kind of underscored the some of the things that I I deal with kind of on on a day to day basis. But um, I, I so there, I, just to point to like some of the challenges that you mentioned as being a woman, um, but um, in general, I think. Um, you know, women, having women um, colleagues has been phenomenal. Um, male colleagues who support having women colleagues is, is so important. Um, women, it, it takes women more being asked more times to run. So if you have, you know, the, it, I think they say like it takes a woman being asked like seven times before she decides to run or eight times. For a man, they'll probably raise their hand and jump right in. Um, hmm. Probably maybe a number of issues um, for that. For me, you know, juggling a family and and those sorts of things made me think twice about, you know, my time commitment and that sort of thing. But um, but in general, I think it's really important to have uh, women at the table and um, and represented in the legislature. So we have a lot of folks putting questions into the chat. Um, the Q&A box. So please continue to do that. I've got one question before we go to a topic that's environmental and it sort of builds on what you were talking about, uh, Assembly One, Dr. Donlan. So, um, you know, a lot of people feel disengaged from voting politics and issues because they're demoralized by the election process. They feel like their vote doesn't matter. Um, you know, and we hear this in primary elections. Sometimes we hear this in general elections. And so it really can be a struggle to get people engaged um, in their state and local government. You mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Donlin, that, you know, folks should get onto a commission, maybe the planning board, the zoning board, environmental commission, shade tree, and all those are great. So what would you say to folks that are out there um, that are feeling a little despondent? Uh, to get them involved in creating good policy, helping make the politics better, um, and, you know, exercising their right to vote and encouraging others too, you know, because there's a lot of steps in the process to register and make sure you've, you know, got your right address by the time and the 45 days and all those different pieces, which we actually think is archaic and we can get rid of it with same day voter registration. But aside from that, like, you know, what advice do you have for, for people that are feeling despondent or who have friends that are feeling despondent in politics? So, so in terms of voting, absolutely your vote it makes a huge difference, especially in local elections, but even in, in state elections, like I, you know, we had, um, we, we, when we won, we, we beat out two incumbents um, who had won the previous term by, I think a couple hundred votes. So literally um, that can make the difference in terms of getting things done or not getting things done or moving policy in the right direction that you, that you, you want to see it 
it move. Um, in terms of local elections, those can come down to a handful of votes. Um, so yes, every vote, every election is important. In New Jersey, we have elections every year. We have them twice a year. We have primary elections if you're uh, registered to um, a a party, um, and then the, the the state, local, federal elections um, at least you know once a year. Um, so every year, it's important to vote. Um, in terms of shaping policy, you know we are all we have an open. We have a great staff first of all. So. Any issues, any thoughts, any pi policy ideas, any concerns, we are always he hearing constituents' voices um, and and shaping it into policy where it make where we think it can make a difference. So if you ever want to email us or call us, our phone number is 732-695-3371. So if anyone wants to reach out with any policy ideas, um, that's we love talking to people. We love getting your ideas. So we're all all ears. We're we're always here. You can make a difference. You do make a difference. And um, yeah, that's all I have to say. We win. Anything else? Thank yeah. you. Um, so eloquent. Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, I you raise the issue about the local voting. I mean, just in Atlantic Highlands, right? There was a the. I think she was, yes, yeah, she was successful eventually. Five votes. Five votes made a determination as to whether or not um, Lori was going to be the mayor of, of Atlantic Island. So every vote does count um, extremely. Uh, and, and you look at even on a national level, um, you know, President Biden won Michigan by 10,000 votes. That's a huge, that's a state. Right. So every vote does count. But as far as, as getting involved, I just want to tell a little anecdote. I was, um, we were at a, um, a fundraiser together, Margie and I, and someone had come up to us and said, you know, I have an idea about, uh, you know, the environment. I'm, I'm into planting. I'm into native plants um, and, and the invasiveness of, of non-native plants. What can we do? And so we sat down and we talked. And there's legislation that had been pending. It's been sitting there for a while. And we're, we're going to renew that. We're going to look at it again. So it's, we hear you. I, I, I really need to get that message across. Call us, we hear you. We are listening to what's going on. We want to make things better um, for our state. So please, Margie, thank you for memorizing the phone number. I was impressed. <laughs> that was great. Um, but if you want to get involved, intern volunteer, learn what the process is. It's really an interesting process that we have in our in our political system. Learn how it works. And then, you know, you'll have that knowledge and be able to pass it on. And the last thing I'm going to say is Ed, what we were talking, you were talking about registering to vote. That is extremely important. And it's getting the excitement out there, right? It's getting, you know, it, you may not be excited about a particular candidate, but you are excited about a particular issue. Raise that up, raise your passion up. Um, it, it does make a difference and, and you will be heard. I think those are uh, all really inspiring and important points. And, um, you know, registering a vote is really great too, but also voting by mail, I'm a big proponent of that. Um, there's a couple of reasons why it's beneficial. One, once you vote, you're generally taken off the list of people who knock on your doors or call you or send you mail. It's helped save the campaign's money, but also helps give you some peace of mind. Um, you know, if you're um, on, I guess, knowledgeable about who to vote for early, I mean, we get ours like almost the beginning of September or something, um, at least by the, in the middle of September. Um, is am I saying that right? Yeah, it's almost that. Well, end mm -hmm. of September, yeah. early October. So like that that cuts off a lot of the election season. And even as someone who's like following and involved in politics, um, there is a peace of mind to that. So I'm very uh, uh, strong on encouraging people to register to vote by mail. Um, it's, it's safe. It's effective. It's verifiable. It's recountable. Um, it's a paper trail, all those things. Um, and it's free, right? Because it, it's postage paid these days and all those different things. But however you're comfortable, it is really critical that you vote. Um, and New Jersey has a great hotline to figure out where your voter registration, where your place to vote is. Um, and we can definitely share that as well. So switching over to some environmental issues, a lot of questions about offshore wind. Offshore wind poses uh, a lot of opportunity for our state to create good local jobs, to create clean energy off our shore, to harness the power of wind, um, to bring clean energy 
into New Jersey that displaces fossil fuels that are currently being used, like oil and gas and creating pollution, predominantly in communities of color, that the, that's where the power plants are, are located in our urban areas, incinerators, which um, mm -hmm. are producing some of our energy, um, and clean up our air. Uh, in, in, I think in addition to that, um, you know, it, there's also the health benefits in, you know, writ large around there. And, and this is locally sourced energy that, you know, can't be, uh, you know, it is created in the jobs right here locally. So we're energy independent. We're not importing oil or gas from other countries. Um, there have been criticisms of offshore wind. Um, and there's a couple of questions that have come in uh, about that. One, um, Jeff had mentioned, you know, why do New Jersey beach property owners see wind as more of a risk to them than the rising seas and storms, like we talked about earlier with beach replenishment? And then Joe also asked the question, was, what ways are you able to speed up the development of offshore wind? How can we help? What other renewables are on the horizon for New Jersey? Agrovoltaics for the Garden State or something that uh, Assemblyman Karabinchek proposed, like wave energy. Um, so maybe we'll go to um, Assemblyman Dr. Uh, Donlin if you wanted to share a little bit about, you know, how are you looking at wind as part of, a, you know, a clean energy solution to help address climate change? Um, and then, you know, also any thoughts that that um, you guys have. And if you still have questions, we're going to have time to get to them. So put them in the um that's, I guess, what that what the little slide is coming up into the Q&A box. Yeah, so as you all probably know, Governor Murphy set a, a goal to be 100% clean energy in the state of New Jersey by 2035. And there's certain um, natural resources we have in this state um, that would help move us in that direction. Um, so wind energy has been, um, I know it's been a controversial topic in New Jersey. I would love to hear more uh, I, I would love to hear more of um, the voices of of uh, support and scientific basis for supporting um, um, wind energy because we've heard a lot of misinformation and I think that's what's been dragging it down um, and I you know with this with social media everything can just um, become very um, a, a small amount of misinformation can uh, can spread like like a virus <laughs> um literally so it's i think com combating misinformation um focusing everything on science and fact um is really important um i know that um the state has already awarded um several wind offshore wind projects uh here in the state of new jersey um so those entities i think have to do their due diligence with involving the public and um having meetings um involving them in terms of education. Um, why is it important that we move towards clean renewable sources of, of energy as a as a state? Um, educating people, what are the facts about wind turbines? For example, there's there's um, there's there's fishermen who are who who actually who who feel that the the wind turbines have in 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 New in New York off the state of New York of Long Island um, have improved the 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 uh, the ecosystem because they they build re you know their their uh, habitat on the bottom of of these uh, wind turbines and they actually increase um, fish life and improve um, attract more sea life so things like that um, that we need to hear more of I think is really important um, but to if you you know if you want to make your voice heard you know send send us letters of support. Um, we'll probably be hearing more about um, the from the companies that are involved and who have received the, the contracts. But I think getting the scientific evidence out there is really important to combat the uh, misinformation as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, Assemblywoman Peter Paul. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what um, Assemblywoman Donlin has just said. It, you know, as I said before, education is really important. What we saw during the course of our election was the misinformation and the disinformation that was out there. And, you know, you have competing interests. You have the businesses that want to be in business with, with wind. And then you have the government that um, is, is trying to pass legislation that will encourage um, curbing greenhouse um, emissions uh, through uh, 
you know, wind and solar energy. And there isn't enough information that is presented to the public in sound bites, right? So that's what our, uh, unfortunately, that's what our um, society is used to, sound bites. Um, but we have to base those sound bites on scientific data. That's the key to all of it. And I think once people begin to understand the importance and the truth and the reality of what's going on, it will make a big difference rather than, you know, the flashing of misinformation that people quickly jump up, jump into. Um, but it is really important, not only that we focus on wind, but that we also focus on, on solar energy um, and reducing, um, you know, curbing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we have to find a way to do it and we have to find a way to do it soon, sooner rather than later. Yeah. And it, you know, I will say, you know, to, to summarize why wind is so important, it really is wind saves lives. Wind takes pollution out of the air, which helps people from getting asthma, cancer, and heart disease and dying too young. And if it's that's your loved one, that's crushing. And we can make a difference cleaning up our air by having resources that we're, we're capturing with wind and solar and, and other, other things um, that'll really make a difference. And we also know there's a lot of misinformation that's funded by the fossil fuel companies. You guys both talked about that, but you didn't necessarily say fossil fuels. I'll add, it is funded by fossil fuels and their bottom line profits to their shareholders are more important than your health. They're willing like the tobacco companies to sell you a product without a warning that will cause you a lifetime of misery and a shortness in your lifespan. And they make no bones about it. They're producing record profits at record prices, and they're spending a ton of money to spread lies, to confuse the public, so they can continue to sell their product to us and make their money. And that's, that's what's happening across the board. The donation pages of all these different anti-groups are all linked. There are these uh, fossil fuel funded groups all around. And I mean, folks can look at Brown University and all the research that they've done into the interconnectedness of this web of deceit funded by fossil fuels so they can continue to pollute our bodies and our communities to make money. And that doesn't mean there's not profits out there in other industries that are moving away from fossil fuels, um, but with the added benefits. The greatest threat to our ocean is climate change itself. The ocean temperatures are rising, the ice is melting, our sea levels are rising, streets are flooding that never flooded before, and our coral reefs are bleaching because increased temperature is increasing the, the pH, and whole ecosystems are collapsing. And that's really the threat of all the marine mammals that is the greatest threat. Greenpeace, you know, they have a great website that talks about this why they support wind energy and they support marine mammals more than any group. They put their literally their lives on the line to save marine mammals. And they have the, they are the North Star on this kind of work. And they understand responsibly developed offshore wind. We have to make sure it's done right at the right times, you know, minimizing impacts um, is a really important um, part of, of our future. So, all right, so other questions have come in. So we have one here um, from Kathleen. Um, so this has to do, this is like sort of a local issue, but I know this affects a lot of things. Electric companies are cutting down, um, uh, but electric companies cutting down, trying to, oh, so this has to do with falling limbs and uh, damaging power lines. Um, she believes that more oversight needs to be managed of indiscriminate tree limb cutting. And then I can say even from my community, sometimes I'm like, oh, like what were they thinking when they cut the tree in this shape? Because now it looks like it's actually going to fall more than it did. But, you know, the branches are going away in a certain direction. And the question really has to do is can we implement a neighborhood advisory group for saving these precious trees that cool our streets and absorb our waters in balance? And, you know, I'll add, this is not her words, um, with making sure we have reliable electricity, right? Because if you're hooked up uh, to some medical equipment, you want to make sure that power is coming through, right? We're very dependent on a whole host of things on hot days, um, the temperature, et cetera. Um, but there, there seems to be um, a, a little bit of an over trimming nature maybe to some of the utilities. And that's what I'm taking from this question. I don't know. Maybe we'll go to, yep. um, yeah. Go ahead. I, I, yeah, I was just going to say, if there's any, um, if we, you know, we have liaisons um, with the power companies. So if there's a particular area that you're concerned about, we're happy to, um, contact them and address the the issue. So um, I, I'll 
if you want to call our office, you're, you can email us. Um, our phone again is 732-695-3371. So you can call our office and let us know um, how where the issue is and how we can help. Um, I think also engaging your town and the shade tree in your town, if you have one, hopefully you have one. Um, again, it's uh, um, to look into some of the, the lo more local issues is, is really important. Anything you wanted to add to something, going, Peter Paul? No, I I think that's spot on. Yet, yeah, I mean, those are issues that our office can can assist with. If there are particular errors, they're coming into your neighborhood. Um, we can we can help with making those phone calls. And I'm putting some things in the chat. Um, one of them is the voter registration deadline, which is October fifteenth, um, and a link to where you can get your voter registration. Make sure you click on your county because every voter registration is by county, and you have to print it out and seal it up and mail it in. Um, general election day is Tuesday, November fifth, so put that on your calendar. It's a, a big presidential, also. It's a big. Uh, it's a big one. Congressional and Senate for New Jersey and also local elections, which really make a difference, uh, school board, all kinds of things. And then I also put a link in here for New Jersey WinWorks. If you're interested in signing up to become more active in voicing your support for Win, which we heard loud and clear from both our assemblywomen, um, you can uh, click on that link and sign up and someone from our uh, team will reach out to you. We really appreciate that. We have some other questions too that have come out. So um, this one's very specific and it's anonymous. So I don't know if this is a third rail kind of question, um, but uh, folks are wondering about the status of the Asbury Park water treatment plant, wondering what's being done about the discharge into ocean near 8th Avenue surfing beach during the downpours that we're experiencing now. So these high rain events. And uh, there was a rumor that a new pipeline was going to run up Ocean Township, uh, the MUA. And did this ever happen? I don't have any specific information on either of those issues, but definitely something I'd like to look into. Um, I don't know yeah. how you get too anonymous, but um, certainly- the other, yeah, yeah, for the other issue, I would encourage you to reach out to the mayor and council there. Um, okay. the it's, it's a local issue, but happy to learn more and um, we can definitely look into it. Um, and I don't know- <laughs> one but i i get how frustrating it is after you you know after a big rain and you want to go surfing because the waves are usually awesome the next day and you know it's often the worst time to go out because of the the uh runoff and the pollution so um yeah that's a tough one and call dp correct yeah okay. <clears throat> Is, is I should know this, but maybe you know this. Is Asbury Park a combined sewer system where the storm drains mix with the the toilet water? I always like to say. Not that I like to say it, but it's the. I don't think I don't, it is. I don't know though. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it is either. But but it's yeah, it sounds like so. Um, you know, one of the uh, other questions that came up here, and it was asked by Eddie. Um, has to do with electric vehicles. So nationwide electric car market has sort of cooled off in the United States. Many manufacturers like Mercedes-Benz, Porsche, Volvo have backtracked uh, their plans to go electric by 2030. Does the cooling EV market affect New Jersey's overall plan for renewable energy to, and to sell only electric cars by 2035? And uh, I'll take a first stab at it if it's okay, because electric vehicles are one of the things that we've been um, sort of working at for quite some time. And, you know, with any new industry, and this is the wind industry as well, uh, you know, a small percentage of people own electric vehicles. It's new. Charging infrastructure, it's not there. It's not where we need to be for everyone to drive an EV. The nice thing about the governor's pledge to move to all electric vehicles is it sends a signal to the market that New Jersey is serious about this. We want to clean up our air. The number one greenhouse gas emitter and pollution emitter in our state is transportation. And most of that is our cars, trucks, and buses. And if we don't get serious about moving to electrification and getting them to be on electric, we're going to still continue to have a lot of pollution. And, and you know that that's really critical. Um, number two is buildings, how we're heating our buildings, oil and gas. We've got to get serious about how we electrify and, and do it in a way that saves money. And both electric vehicles and building electrification are going to save homeowners, and folks driving on either public transportation and their own car money. I drive an electric vehicle. I save $1,800 a year over gas. 
That's a lot of money. Now, they're a little bit more money to buy in the beginning, but you can make that back over time. And so similar to the fossil fuel industry, there is a, a, a lobby out there, both the fossil fuel industry to sell their product and some um, auto dealerships that like fixing traditional cars that need spark plugs, which electric vehicles don't, right? Or other types of wear and tear, like brakes don't go as bad as fast in an EV because when you let off the accelerator, you capture that energy back to the battery to do regenerative braking. So you don't go through brake pads as much, but you go through tires faster because they they accelerate really fast. So like there's some sort of uh, trade-off by that. Um, and, you know, with those challenges also it gets confusing to the market. And um, a lot of folks that are moving forward with it, which is great, and we like to see that, New Jersey needs to be better about its infrastructure. And I think the uh, IRA under the Biden administration is really investing in ways that are meaningful and long-term are going to help provide the kinds of solutions um, that we need. We're big proponents of it. I mean, all of our New Jersey transit buses, all of our public transportation should be electrified. School buses, kids shouldn't be choking on diesel fuel going to and from school. I get on a school bus, I was a teacher, and I'm like, oh my God, I remember the smell from when I was a kid. You know, like, it's gross. It can't be good for health. We know it's not. We need to do something about it. How we get it done, it's going to have fits and starts. It's going to be a little bit complicated. It's not going to be perfect. And there are challenges. So I'm like, I'm getting all that out there because like we're aware of, of all of these components. Um, and particularly with industries kind of rolling back different components, they're looking at market forces, they're looking at buyer demand, also supply chain. Uh, cars, um, electric vehicles have really run into some supply chain issues, which have making them more expensive mm -hmm. and it's costing it out for folks. Um, New Jersey, we go through the $30 million of incentives in about six months. So we really should be spending 60 million, which it looks like we're about to do again under the governor, which is great. And there's the federal incentives as well. So I said a lot of stuff, a lot to say about electric vehicles. I'm passionate about them, but I know it's going to take time. The reality is, you know, it was really disappointing to see the governor get rid of the sales tax exemption for electric vehicles, because that was one way to make them more cost effective. We would have liked to see a ceiling on the sales tax for, you know, not the ones with the wings that open and the super fancy hundred whatever thousand dollars, but a normal car, you know, forty five, fifty five thousand dollars and less can get the sales tax exemption. But it's eliminated, you know, going to be eliminated whole whole cloth. And that makes it less cost competitive. And that's anti clean air, in my opinion. Um, so anything else you guys want to add about that? Because I'm going to I have to do a wrap up. I, um, do your wrap I did up. a little soapbox. No, that was that, that was a great. Right? Yeah. And that's why you had this organization. <laughs> but but I also but I also recognize too that um, you know there are there are opportunities for us to make this easier for folks and answer some of their questions. So as legislators, I would challenge you as well to you know to think about that. What's it like to be in a multi um, a multi unit dwelling or in a townhome complex where you don't have control of a driveway or a nice garage where you can plug your own vehicle in? These are some of the things we need to think about: municipal charging, charging at work, charging at school, um, and we can do it. I I, I know that we can. Um, and I'm, I'm optimistic about the future. All right, last question. I'm going to pass it to each of you. I have to go back to my sheet. I highlighted it in yellow, which is, okay. Um, so you're just starting your legislative careers. Um, so I'll just ask you to think um, the end of your legislative career. What could you say you accomplished? Just one thing for the environment in your career that made it worthwhile. And what would it be? I'll give you a minute to think if you don't... If, mm -hmm. We talk about zappers and mullers. Zappers like just always have an answer right away, and the mullers get some time to think. So I give you a minute. I didn't pressure. So you I on. hope our, our legislative career isn't tomorrow or or the next legislative session, right? So uh, what I'm I'm hoping and and my desire is is that we there are a lot of achievements along the way. Um, you know, it's important that we like we're proud in New Jersey, right? We, we are very proud of who we are. And I think that we need to um, remember that we need to lead our country in terms of renewable energy. We need to start the work or continue the work to do that, to curb the, the greenhouse gas emissions, um, supporting investments in, in wind and solar energy, um, educating our constituents about the importance of doing that. and. Hopefully, at the end of my legislative career, 
I will have looked back and said, okay, I helped to make New Jersey a greener, healthier, and more prosperous state in which all of us live in. Thank you. That's amazing. I love that goal. Uh, I, wow, there's, I mean, there's so many things I want to do. Um, we, we run for re-election every two years. So in my mind, my goal is always to, to be in office long enough that my 14 year old daughter will be able to vote for me. So she's got four more, mm -hmm. I'm thinking like, maybe I'll be there for six more years. Um, anyway, so in six, in about six years, I would love to um, do more for our coastal communities in terms of preventing um, beach erosion and um, preventing the flooding issues that we're having locally. Um, I think sustainability um, as a, a coastal community is really inherent on our ability to move towards clean energy um, as a whole and um, you know whatever we can do in that direction and then support um, local towns to reduce flooding um, preserve open space, preserve trees. Um, we just, in our last uh, legislative session, we, I sponsored a bill um, to uh, to get $101 million in funding to provide to local uh, governments and municipalities to purchase open space and to protect open space. So that's one thing that I'm very happy um, we did this legislative session. I hope to expand on that. Um, protecting our coastal communities and preserving and protecting open space for the future generations awesome. of voters. <laughs> so, so this is great. Um, and I will just say, as much as I want you to be able to do all that yourselves, I know that you can't. And so the people that are on this call, um, the webinar today and others that are going to listen in the future, it's up to all of us to work together in partnership. That elected officials, they need wind behind their back. And that comes from their constituents, that comes from their supporters, and it's a team effort. And we're you know, proud to be part of that team and work with you on your vision for the environment. And I also know you have a lot of fans, and I don't think they're your family members. We had Rachel thanking you so much for everything that you're doing, Dan, Joe, um, and the list sort of goes on here. And so I wanna thank them and also challenge them to be part of delivering those amazing visions for the environment and our future. I wanna thank both uh, assembly women for their time tonight, for being environmental champions, for sharing their work with us and their insights and experiences, a little bit look behind the curtain of what's happening. I'm gonna share how you can follow um, on social media, uh, Donlin and Peter, Peter Paul, um, at Donlin and Peter Paul. I put it in the chat as well. I want to thank our co-sponsors tonight who helped um, you know, drive attendance and are going to share out this uh, video recording, which is going to be on our YouTube channel, uh, New Jersey Association of Environmental Commissions, Clinicians for Climate Action of New Jersey, New Jersey Nature Conservancy, Water Spirit, the New Jersey Sustainable Business Council, and the New Jersey Conservation Foundation. Um, and of course, it, it's really important to thank the audience for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you very much for all that you do. You can learn more about us at New Jersey LCV, um, and our website is njlcv.org. Put that in the chat for you as well. You can also sign up to learn more about our future events and opportunities to join our listservs for issues that you care about, anything from open space and clean water, clean air, um, energy issues, um, so we can protect the environment together, because it really does take all of us. Our handle is at NJLCV, um, and you can also email us at information at njlcv.org. Uh, today's event is recorded on our YouTube channel, and um, I want to thank you again and wish everyone a happy summer. Enjoy the rest of August and have a lovely week, and look forward to continuing to work with you uh, to make New Jersey the best, greenest uh, state in America. And I think we've got a lot of opportunity and a lot to pat ourselves on the back for. Um, and, and it's going to be a, a great experience. And having both environmental champions tonight on the call um, and this webinar has, has really been inspirational for me. And so I look forward to working with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Yeah, have a great night. You too.